This content is brought to you by Fisher Improvement Technologies Online, a learning platform that includes self-paced courses, knowledge sharing, and networking opportunities for safety, quality, and performance improvement professionals. Join now for free at online.improvewithfit.com. This, this, this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Years helping leaders reducing errors and incidents. Here is your host of the Essential Leadership Cycle Podcast, Rob Fisher. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another round of the Essential Leadership Cycle Podcast. I'm your host and intentional leader, Rob Fisher. And we've got a real treat today. Uh, Mark Wilkinson is an entrepreneur from the UK. Uh, Mark and I met through a mutual friend, Ian Collins, and uh, and I think we just kind of hit it off. And Mark is a is an author uh, of a book that's about to re- be released called Life Remixed, but he's a super interesting character in that uh, you know he he lived his life as a DJ, even even got some songs in the UK top ten, um, and currently he's the CEO of a company over there in the UK. So Mark, why don't you tell people about yourself, and then we'll get it started. First of all, hi Rob, thanks for having me on, mate. Really appreciate it. Uh, across the uh, across the ocean uh yeah so uh, yeah mark wilkinson that's me i was a dj when i was um younger i was a resident dj at ministry of sound when i was 25 i was uh living a dream life there um having a great time uh but also having a, a battle with some uh, addictive tendencies should we say as a young lad um and it was great fun. I mean, it was great fun up to a point. And then, uh, unfortunately, one day I physically collapsed. Uh, I was 33 years of age. I, I couldn't walk. Uh, I lost my way completely. My body froze up. I was in absolute agony. Um, and I didn't know what was going on. And I just got into a real sort of spiral of down, down, down. And so that was really tough. Um, but the book is about my, a little bit about my story of that that time and what happened there and then a lot about strategies that I've used to fix it um, and strategies that anybody can use by the way uh, and that's the point the point is um, in the last 10 years uh, particularly after the incurable disease in my 30s and then uh, bankruptcy uh, shortly after that I've managed to turn my life around now to be the most successful happy healthy wealthy that I've, I've ever been in my life I also got highly qualified as a chartered member of IOSH and a fellow of the Institute of Leadership and Management, which I'm very, very happy with. Um, and these are things that I use every single day uh, in leading myself and other people and multiple businesses. I, I mean, it's a fantastic story. And, you know, in keeping with the Essential Leadership Cycle podcast, one of the, fir- the first element is self and team awareness. How much do you think that your self-awareness, uh, you, you're very familiar with the e-colors, which we have is, is very centric to, to the essential leadership cycle. Um, how much do you think that played into uh, later on you understanding how you got to where you got and, and maybe even some of the tools for, for um, sustainability in where you've gotten? Well, first of all, you and I are both yellow blue, right? So right. We're, <laughs> we're big socializers, you know, this, co- this podcast could go on for ages, right? But we're big socialists, big, big talkers, we love it. Um, and we love being around people and we love the buzz and, and that kind of stuff. And, and that's, you know, I, I was blissfully unaware of myself and my awareness and my energy and in my spirituality or anything when I was younger. Um, and uh, I just lived my life and, and made lots and lots of mistakes and it's all in this book. Um, a friend of mine, when I was just starting to sort of become more self-aware uh, anyway, I was doing a lot of work with Bob Proctor, with Tony Robbins, uh, both huge in, in the States and, and Canada, obviously, um, and, and fantastic characters, really um, strong on leadership um, and guidance. I did a lot of study there. And then one of my friends introduced me to, to Equilibria uh, and said to me, um, just try this PDI test, he, or, yeah, personal diversity indicator, I should say. Uh, and um, he worked offshore on the rigs. He's a subsea surveyor, and he, and he had experience of the, of using Equilibria and the Equilibria coaches. And he said, "Try it out." And I had a go at it, and it just came out that yeah, obviously, you know, just I answered the questions. It was me, right? And it, I was like, "Wow, this is amazing." And actually, on my Equilibria uh, profile on, on yellow blue, it says things. It said things like. Um, uh you know you love parties you're socializing you love parties well i was a dj right uh but he also said in some way he said another place he said yeah, you, you will love music 
and you will love parties. I was like, my God, this is amazing. This is amazing. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, okay, it was me that answered the question, but I was still like, oh, wow, you know, this is, this is a, what a great sort of indicator. And, and when it showed me about my potential limiters and my green, my logic was very, <laughs> was very low. Um, uh, my yellow, and, uh, my blue and red were very um, uh, balanced, but uh, my, my green was very low. And I, I just looked at my coaching opportunities to learn. Um, and I picked up that area of, of I'm not going to say weakness, but that area where I could improve. Uh, and I focused in on that area very strongly for the next 10 years. And I went from bankrupt to the board of directors of actually Heathrow Airport and, uh, and uh, Barclay Homes. I mean, I was dealing with very, very senior people there. Um, and um, I did that within 10 years. And I, I went from, from bankrupt to, to great salaries. Um, and, and I used, I used equilibrium and I used the e-colors to benefit my career. And interestingly, I also got my wife to, uh, well, at the time she was my girlfriend, I got her to do e-colors and, um, uh, she went through the, the, the personal diversity indicator came out the other side. She's huge green and very small amount of yellow. So we're just like, we're just like this perfect fit where we just like, we yeah. make each other better. Um, she's got the skills that I haven't got and vice versa. Uh, and it gave me a better understanding of her as an individual that she likes to think things through, that she's slower than me and she likes to be more methodical. But then once I, th once I knew that, I could be more accepting, more understanding and, and therefore, you know, a better, a better future husband as I have become. <laughs> so. Right. Well, and, and I mean, I, I think that anybody that really pays attention to that has that experience in that, you know, we've been married over 40 years. And, and we like to say that we've been, uh, we've been uh, married uh, 40 years and together 17 because of all of my travel. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. You know, understanding uh, very similarly, my wife, uh, her e-colors are blue over green mm -hmm. and very strong blue over green. And understanding what those traits are helps also understand the needs, mm -hmm. the approach. And even though we may not even not, uh, understand or sometimes even agree with the approach. Um, at least we can understand where it comes from, that it's not this, uh, they're trying to get you by underhandedly doing this. It's the process under which they think and that they convince themselves of things. And sometimes, I mean, in life and in business, being able to use that in both uh, areas has been extremely useful. Yes, yeah, so I think Emerald could also appreciate the fact that I'd had a 20 year DJ career um, and, and that was driven by my my personality. You know, it wasn't the other way around. It, you know, it was, it was driven by me to actually become uh, that DJ and that party person. And, that you know, I would travel to 65 countries myself and went all over the globe and had records in the top 10, like you said. And, and uh, you yeah, know, I had some amazing times, absolutely amazing times. And then it was that was amazing fun but I didn't get the balance right. And I think that was the problem. And that's, that's why it all went, it all went bad. Well, and we, we, we sometimes, uh, I see that toppy color yellows that uh, desire to please and help others can, can feel like we're doing something good for ourselves, but in reality, we're depleting our resources to give to others. And we don't see that as a depletion of our resources. I, I don't know if you've experienced the same thing. Very much so with business coaching and life coaching and happy, happiness and health coaching, all the things I do now. Um, there are times when I, I, you know, can actually just be go, 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 go. Uh, and I'm helping other people and I'm buzzing and bouncing around. And all of a sudden my energy just goes, you know, <laughs> whoa, you know, I need to get that balance. And Emma's very good at reminding me about that. Yeah. All on or all off sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Go, 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 crash. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um so how do you uh, you know as you've remixed your life and and you know that'll all show up in your in your book how how have you how do you manage um balancing or discovering whether you have a shared vision and values with people that you work with or clients or potential clients mm -hmm. uh, because you've kind of lived both sides of that world yeah, I mean, I, I would very much uh, like every single company and business and 
individual that I interact with to uh, to do the uh, equilibria PDI because there's a lot of people that come to me consultants wise that I'd say to them are you happy to to do this because I'd love you to do it because here's my this is my tendencies and this is how I am and that really helps um, and so that's a mission <laughs> that's a mission to to achieve in itself and we're going to keep going um, I think uh, for me I heard a very intelligent person once say very successful businessman say, uh, I only hire attitude because everything else I can train. And I really like that. I thought that was a really sensible comment because if someone's got a poor attitude to leadership or safety or coaching or whatever it's going to be, you're always going to struggle. You're always going to struggle trying to get to that person to actually be able to uplift them or get them into the business and get them working you know, in a successful way. Whereas actually, if you get someone who may not have all the knowledge in the world, but actually has a fantastic attitude. And when we talk about attitude, we're talking about thoughts, feelings and actions. When that person's got that fantastic attitude, they're a sponge. They want to learn. They want to grow. They want to, you know, and, and that's that's for me is what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for with with clients, with um, with with um, people that we work with across all of our. We've got 10 businesses, you know. Um, including four property business, a health and safety business, and many other things. Um, someone called me a serial entrepreneur recently. Uh, but the point is, is that, you know, I'm looking for those kind of people with that great attitude. If they've got that great attitude, then, then we can work together. And then obviously we can develop. And the better we understand each other, and that's what Equilibrium was all about for me. First of all, as I was going through this journey of self-awareness, it just made me more aware. It made me more aware. Uh, and I spoke to Lewis Senior the other day, actually, because uh, I'm, I'm going to put um, uh, uh, some information about Equilibria in the book because it has been uh, a tool that I've used over the last 10 years to change my life. You know, it's a very, very useful tool for everybody. Uh, and I said, is that OK, Lewis? And he said, yeah, it's fine. Put a link in there. I said, I can't do it. <laughs> so, um, so he's obviously uh, fully on board. And, and yeah, we, we love Lewis and the rest of the team over there as well. So. Uh, let me let me circle back to something about the attitude. Do you think that that people with a better with a good attitude can be more resilient? Because people that are that are technically competent, um, the box is a little bit tighter. But people with a, whose attitude is easy to to um, work with have a little bit more resiliency. And and right now, I mean in business and life and the world, it seems like resilience is something that we really need. Absolutely. I mean, this, this book came about because I was not resilient when I was younger. Uh, I was highly emotional. I was all over the shop. You know, I was, <laughs> I wasn't the best young man. I wasn't the best son. I wasn't the best boyfriend to, to women. And, and uh, yeah, I just made a real mess of a few things, but I learned resilience. Um, but that resilience came from actually being completely open-minded. The open mindedness, the open mindedness actually came from being brought to my knees with with nothing, with a with a dis ease in my body that actually almost wipes me out. I mean, I had a choice. It was go and jump off a bridge or actually dust myself off and try again. Uh, and it was when I watched The Secret and Bob Proctor and, and then started to connect with Tony Robbins and that kind of stuff. But that emotional resilience, I mean, there was a there was a real light bulb moment for me. And sometimes, you know, you read a quote or something, just you go, you go, ah, oh, yeah, it just resonates with you. Well, I, I wasn't really expecting this one, but there was uh, there was two things from Bob Proctor that he said in my early days of my study. Um, he said, um, he said, uh, what anyone else thinks of you is none of your business. And that for me was a real light bulb moment because I was like, oh, okay, you know. I, I spent so much time like thinking about everybody else and what, you know, worrying and trying to work. As soon as that penny dropped for me, I was like, okay, so I'll just concentrate on, on, on me and self-awareness and get myself to the best I possible bit can possibly be. And everything else, hopefully from what Bob's telling me should fall into shape, fall into place. That's uh, a little bit different. That's a little bit, bit of a twist on that phrase as well. And, and it's a bit of an important twist. Right. You hear a lot of people say, well, you shouldn't care what other people think or, you know, but there's a very strong refinement. Can you just say that phrase again? Because I think that 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 yeah. refined twist really better describes the way you need to think about that. Well, what anyone else thinks of you is none of your business. 
Yeah. Just, you know, just get it. that to me was, I, it was just like this huge load got lifted off my shoulders. And I just went, ah, okay. So it's none of my business. Right. Okay. So let's just focus in on, on myself. And the other thing that was said to me in that time was your way isn't working. Try mine. And I said, yeah, I had nothing to lose. So I said, fine, yeah, let's do it. But those two pieces of information together, what anyone else thinks of you is none of your business. Because many of us live in a kind of like mental prison of, of fear, of, of not doing anything because it might, you know, someone else might judge me or, or, or it, you know, it might not work out or, or you know, and a lot of people want to, a lot of people want to stay in this little sort of, you know, very, very safe area when actually all of the juice of life and all of the success of life is moving outside of your comfort zone. Right. Yeah. I don't know anyone personally that has been a massive success inside their comfort zone. It's, I'm not even sure it's possible. That's right. I mean, you know, it, it, constant growth, you know, I mean, this book came about when I was going through personal crisis, life remixed was when I was going through incurable disease, bankruptcy, breaking up a you know, a long-term relationship, everything just hit the fan at once and I was on the floor. And as I said, I had a choice and my choice, thankfully, was to say, no, I'm better than this and let's go again. Now, the world is going through a crisis at the moment and there is a great many people that need some strategies to be able to lift themselves out, out of this, this funk, out of this time. Um, you know, a great many businesses have gone by the wayside or going by the wayside. There's people struggling. 12 years ago, when Bob Proctor said, your way isn't working, try mine. I said, fine. And I just did multiple sources of income. I learned equilibria. I've got myself off the floor. I did huge, uh, great success in, in, in the corporate world and now great success in the entrepreneurial world. And, and I'm so grateful that that happened to me 12 years ago because it's prepared me for this crisis. Um, and I guarantee you, in Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, I guarantee you, he studied 500 millionaires for 25 years and put it all in that book. I guarantee you there'll be another crisis along in seven to 10 years after this one. Right. And so we need to be preparing for that one now. Right, exactly. Yeah. I, I've, I've always found it, also found it amazing that you and Lewis Sr. both wound up on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read when I read uh, Lewis's book at the end of the day. When I read it, I was just like, "This is me. This is yeah. this. This is my guy. This is like you know." Someone just said to me, "Oh, you should try this. This e colors." I had a look at it, looked at oil rigs, and at the time, I was hoping that I might work offshore and, and work in the industry, and, and that never materialized. But as it turned out, it, it didn't need to because I went another path. Right. But as soon as I read, I, I found out about equilibrium. I read Lewis's book. I was like, "Oh, what? This is this is exactly what's happened to me." And I'd already by that time, I'd already had the idea of life remixed, and the story for me was. I was unable to walk for 18 months and suicidal and in a terrible state. And I went from that and cured myself of this incurable disease and ran four marathons. I ran the London marathon three times and Berlin once. Um, and then from bankrupt to financial freedom, which is where I am today. Um, that's the story. Right. Uh, but it, along the way, I did, as I say, Equilibria Tools. I did a, um, a master's in leadership and management with the fellow fellowship now of the Institute of Leadership and Management. These are all amazing things that have helped me along the way. And all I've done is be a sponge. Yeah. Just well, and, and, and in the end, it's nice to have a story. It's great you have a story. The story is told in Life Remixed. But the icing on that cake is the people that you will help not because they're you or not because they have to be, be like you, but the nuggets that they take mm. from something like your book or something like this conversation yeah. that says, you know, maybe I'll give it one more shot. Maybe I'll give it one more minute. Maybe I'll give it 10 more seconds in some people's cases uh, in the, in the, in the world that we're in today. I think it was Winston Churchill that said, get up once more, one more time than you fall down. Uh, you know, and every, you know, we, we fail our way to success in many, in many ways, you know, we, we uh, when we're children, you know, if we're trying to walk and we fall down, you know, we get up again, don't we? And we get up and we get up until we can do it. And, and you know, mine was a very public kind of uh, uh, failure, you know, but it was a, actually now I'm massively grateful for it. It was a huge learning event in my life and it's helped me become a successful uh, husband, 
uh, sun, you know, all the good stuff. Um, but again, it's, it's not really about me. The whole the book's not really about me. The book is literally all the information I've just grabbed from all these hugely wise people from thousands of years. And I've just put it all into this book and gone, try these things because these things have worked for me. And they just changed my, my inner self. And I heard, of, I was listening to one of your other podcasts earlier and it was sort of talking all about self-awareness and self-awareness has to come first. Right. You cannot help other people. You cannot give other people what you haven't got. So if you work on you and you study and you learn, and I was reminded of another thing as well. I don't know if you know the word education. Do you know where it comes from? Go ahead. It comes from a Greek word, which is eduko. And that means the actual definition of educo means to draw out from within. Now, in education wise, in, in the Western world, a lot of the time, we reward people for all the things they can remember. Right. Rather than what we're actually bringing out from within them. And I think equilibrium is an excellent tool for that because it actually brings out from within and you go, oh, right. OK, so this is how I am. These are my colors and this is what I'm positive at. And there's some areas here that I could look at to improve. And. That's awesome. And then, then if you follow that, then when you start putting together uh, some structure, that that's when you get into that clarity of roles and processes. And and I'm sure it's the same uh, with you and your wife and and in your business as it is with us. That being self aware and aware of your team and your partner, and making sure that you've you have aligned values. Then let, then let you create that third driving element of clarity of roles and processes so that, um, so that people are doing what, what they're good at or they're doing what they can be good at. They're using that attitude, uh, but you're not just throwing rules at people and then expecting everybody to follow them and hoping things are going to be okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are in the people business. In fact, it, just about everyone's in the people business. We, you know, we keep people safe with with our Hillmont Associates company. Uh, we coach, we show leadership. We, uh, you know, the, the purpose of this book is to help a lot of people. It's about it's about showing strategies that have worked, and then you know, I, I find I find particularly with health and safety and construction here in the UK, you know, there's certain uh, people that walk around. They're just telling guys that have been working on the job for like 20 years what they shouldn't you know shouldn't be doing i never i never do that all i do is I, all i do is ask questions right i just ask questions i'm like is, is is that right is that the most sensible way to do it are we you know how are you feeling what's going on you know is there pressure what's happening you know because the leadership comes from the top of every company and you can feel it when you're actually out there with with the guys on the shop floor and stuff like that you know well, we, so, we actually call it the difference between observation, which is going out to watch people do things right and wrong, and engagement, where you're going out to have a conversation of people to discover or learn, or to use your term, edu, educate. Hmm. Um, uh, and engagement does that, especially if the people know that you're not just there to watch them, that you're, they know you're not just there to catch them doing something. This is exactly right. We're all grown adults. <laughs> we're all grown adults. We're there to help and support one another. People say to me, how have you gone from a DJ to like a health and safety director as an owner of a company? And some people can't join the dots to that at all. Um, mine came together for me when I discovered what my real purpose was in life. Many, many people self-development director, you know, people, uh, Bob Proctor, Tony Robbins, all these kind of guys, um, Kevin Green here in the UK, who's now my business coach and mentor here. Uh, they all ask, what's your why? What's your purpose? Right. Never answer that question. I could never get it. And then finally, I, I it clicked. It all, it's a long story. It's in the book. But basically, I gave a talk to some students and I got the same feeling from giving the talk to the students as I did from DJing. And I was like, aha, right. I like to bring joy to other people. I like to be engaging. Uh, I like to bring knowledge. It's all written on my wall up there. I've got a poster, bring joy, knowledge, inspire, and create. That's my four things. And as long as I do them in, in a good place and I live my life on purpose. But that was a real moment of clarity for me because when you can actually like live your own life on purpose and then give to other people with an open heart, you're in a really, really good place. You know, I'm not there to 
annihilate someone for doing something wrong at work. I'm there to say, hang on, mate. I want you to have a good day at work. I want you to enjoy your life. I want you to be in a good place. I want to coach you to a higher level. I want to get you to where you, you know, where you're going to be. I want you to be at home with your family tonight, having a great evening. You know, it's not about right, wrong, up, down. It's about joy, knowledge, inspire, create. And that you can do that in music. You can do that in property. You can do that in health and safety. You can do that in anything. Right. And that was powerful. Well, two, two things about that. The first one is that uh, I, a, a quick personal story from the other day. Somebody said, what do you miss the most in the pandemic? Mm. And I said, the light bulbs. Mm. Because when you're talking to somebody and they get something that they didn't have before, mm. you can really just see the light bulb go off. Mm. And I struggle with doing that like this mm. over the internet. Uh, sometimes you can see it, but when there's 20 or 30 people in a, in in an electronic room, it's a little bit harder to see. But when there's 20 or 30 people in a physical room, you can actually see those light bulbs go off. And I think, I think it's very similar to what you're saying is that um, bringing that joy to someone, uh, watching them shift their paradigm because they want to. Absolutely. Yeah. Is, is, I mean, for lack of a, using a cornier term, is magical to me. And I understand what you're saying. I mean, there's a universal law that says force negates. If you try and force something, it makes it negative. Yeah. Don't force anything. Just be. And when and when you just be, then you can then be effective. Yeah. Well, and that that's why we like to use that engagement. Mm -hmm. and, and and you know, so the other thing that I was going to talk about, and it's something that's really bothering me, is that. I think that we have drawn a line of separation between the way um, people should be approached and the way people either want to approach them or not approach them at all. And I think that we use the term soft skills and it's a terrible term. <laughs> if you think about it from a personality perspective, um, people that aren't people, people, we think that soft skills aren't really useful because I'm a technical person and people that are people, people think they've already got them, but I think soft skills are anything, but they're actually kind of hard and you have to, for us, they may be a little bit easier because of our personality tendencies. We naturally migrate to that, but other people have to manage their personality tendencies to do. So let's stop calling them soft skills. <laughs> Let's, you, Rob. they're the you. needs of people. <laughs> I'm with you. I mean, yeah, there, there seems to be, you know, a lot, sometimes there seems to be a lot less value put on. I've, I've, I've worked with certain auditors and various people and, you know, they're more interested in, in filling a box than they are with actually the person that's actually delivering the job. And at the end of the day, those people delivering the job, they're the most important people on the, on the planet you know they're, they're the ones that are down there doing it and making stuff happen growing construct you know constructing buildings and whatever you know fitting out buildings and stuff like that that's that's the most important part of yeah, anything those, those organizations put the value on the box i know right I, I mean that's where they put their metrics they put the metrics on the number of boxes instead of the instead of the the interactions or engagements with the people one of our things that hillmont associates as a health and safety company is that we're different to that so are we very different. That's why that's why we're here together. Like attracts like, Rob. That's why we're here talking, because yeah. uh, you know we we don't we don't. You know, don't get me wrong. The the, the statutory stuff, of course, and the and the assurance and the governance, yeah. of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. However, there's a whole other part to that that that, that you know when you motivate people and you uplift people, uh, you can you can achieve just about anything. I agree, and 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 again that that piece of. Uh, that's what generates the trust mm. is, is having, you know, self team more in a shared vision of values, clear roles and processes. Trust is generated. It's, it's um, developed instead of demanded. Yeah. And I see, I see in a lot of organizations that they're having to recover from demanded trust. And they're always shocked when their uh, um, surveys come back where employee engagement is low mm. and trust is low and the, the leaders, the senior leaders, especially are just baffled 
by that piece. But I think if you watch these driving elements all along, you wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if your trust and engagement was low. Leadership is, 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 you know, so vital. And there's many leaders that I've observed that are in their roles for their own ego uh, and rather than actually leading the people. The best thing to do if you're a leader is to, is to lead by uplifting everybody else. Um, this, again, I go back to Think and Grow Rich, which is an amazing book, 500 Millionaires, 25 Years, Napoleon Hill, put it all in there. In there. Um, but uh, there's people, he's interviewing people like Henry Ford, the book was written back in like 19, you know, in the early 1900s, but it's, it's relevant today as it, as it ever was. Um, he's talking to people like Henry Ford and he's saying, well, you know, you need to know everything. And he's like, no, I don't. He said, I just need to, I just need to make sure that that person there knows exactly what they're doing and they just keep me updated and that's it. I don't need to know everything. I don't need to control everything. I don't need to be micromanaging. I just need to lead. I just need to uplift. So this person, you'd be the best you can be at that area and you'd be the best you can be in that area. And as a team, we'll, think of a football manager, you know, we, we call, you call it soccer, but think, you know, think of a you know, football manager, a great football manager. He's got 11 different positions on the field uh, and he's got a right winger and he's got a centre forward and he's got a centre back, back. And, that, you know, he's got to get the best out of all these people. And they're all different and they're all individual. And he puts them together as a team and he makes them the best they can be. And the great managers are the ones that actually can do that and, and make something you know, amazing happen. Um, and you can do that in any walk of life. Oh, absolutely. It, you know, it's funny that um, that Think and Grow Rich was one of the books that changed my path mm. back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I had a, a somebody that I really looked up to and trusted a mentor that said, you know, read this. And I said, I, I really don't need to read that. I'm not rich. I'm never going to be rich. Um, I don't really think that I need to hear what rich people do. And he said, why don't you read it? And then we'll have a conversation about it. Wise, wise man, wise man. Yeah, yeah. And there, you know, there were a couple of other, couple of other books that, that all the way back then when I was a lot younger, really, really sent me that way. But back, back to your point as well on, I, I was talking to a senior leader and this is probably a couple of years ago now, I've lost all track of time. I found out when you turn 60, you time changes. So apparently it doesn't have anything to do with position in the universe. It's a specific point in time in your life. And for me, that was 60. So it may have been a couple of years ago, may have been a couple of months ago, but I was talking to this senior leader and he was convinced that he was promoted to his position because he was the smartest person around. Okay. <laughs> and, and on the one hand, you don't want to try and convince somebody that maybe they're not the smartest person around. But in, in his case, it was because he knew everything that needed to be done about all the jobs of all the people that worked for him. And I was just flabbergasted to the point of almost not being able to speak for a couple of minutes. And then, then we started having some discussions, but it's, it's kind of amazing that in, in, in the business environment, you have uh, organizations that have promoted people due to their technical prowess mm -hmm. to a position where that technical prowess isn't nearly as important as the way they treat people. Well, I looked, uh, I remember being at a seminar um, and a guy came out and he was talking about leadership and he said, how many people are in leadership positions in, in this room? And 200 people, you know, put their arms in the air. And he said, okay, and how many of you have got a leadership qualification? And maybe one person left their hand up. And it's just very telling that, isn't it? Because leadership is, is not a soft skill. It's a real thing that you must educo, you must, you know, must learn, you must be drawn out from within you generally by a mentor or a coach or someone positive that you look up to that, that can actually make or help you make changes. One of the things I, I, I thought about there when you were talking as well is um, another great quote that I heard that's really helped me was observation is power and judgment is weakness. Uh, and I used to find myself quite often being quite judgy, you know, walking around like, oh, he's this, he's Make that. You're the beast, right? Yeah. So we were taught in safety. Well, yeah, absolutely. But but what I just I just it just made me it just really helped me because when I learned that observation is power and to observe and then engage, as you said, but to observe and then engage is so much more powerful than being judgy and I'm the best and you're not as good as me. And oh, yeah, there's a lot of mental energy that goes into that yeah. that life, uh, and and it's a lot nicer and a lot calmer 
to be in a really good place and just be like, okay, that's fine. And I think one of the things that helped me was that everyone is doing the best they can with the knowledge they have at this moment. Right. That really, uh, that I was like, ah, uh, uh, okay. So they are doing the best they can. It's not up to me. Who am I to judge anyone anyway? So just be that more, more sort of calming, more accepting, you know, and, and actually calm down, speed up is a, is a beauty. And, and I'm, the calmer I am, the more effective I am. Right. And that's leadership as well. I guess. Yeah, it's leadership of the self. First. Absolutely. And, and, then, and then that can be a modeled behavior in your organization. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, that piece about observation is when you use that term, you're talking about being able to see. We're actually doing some work now with, it's called visual literacy. And visual literacy uh, started in the art world. It said, you know, a lot of people walk by a painting and they see what they can see in two seconds, yeah. but they don't really observe and they can't really make a, an interpretation because, because we just let our brain fill in what we want to see. So if you're going out to do, if you're not going out to observe so you can see the world, if you're going out to do a physical observation and you're going out to do that observation with the intent of judgment, in other words, I've got to tick the box. These are how many people I need to coach. These are how many things I need to find wrong. Then you're going to, you're going to get a lot of information, but the information isn't probably going to be very valid. And it's certainly not going to help the people that you could observe and engage with uh, minus the judgment. So if you take the judgment out, you take it out as, as part of the thing you're out there to look to do. Majority of people go only on their five senses, which is to see, hear, taste, taste, touch, and smell. And actually, you know, as you said there, you can see anything, but to actually like observe and actually get a feeling, um, that is something different. And, and I think you only find that by calming down uh, and actually, you know, becoming a better leader of yourself first, because you can't lead others unless you can control and lead yourself. Um, and so that for, for me, that was the, that was the hardest thing to swallow. I think, you know, when I was, you know, I thought I knew it all when I was young, you know, I was ministry of sound ego, you know, DJ, you know, I'm, I'm the best, you know, I'm super cool me, you know, well, in the world. Yeah. You know, it was, <laughs> misguided at best right um but the most interesting man without a beard <laughs> yeah and it was just it was it was weird but I, I i'm so glad that i kind of went through that process because i had a, i did have a good life things were fun um and but uh, when i became a bit more uh universally aware of universal laws and also my own spirituality and putting my ego aside and everything else i became more interested in other people i'm fascinated by humanity yeah. You know, one of the things I got into safety about and health and safety about was like the, the psychology of accidents and incidents, you know, and understanding where they come from. And, and you know, but, but it's about the individuals. If I can walk around when I'm doing inspections on site, I've been doing some recently for a, a client just to help out. Um, and I've been out there and, and I just I just spread a bit of joy. I just make sure the guys are, you know, in a good place. You're right. Is everything going on? I crack a couple of jokes, you know, uh, you know, I, but I enjoy myself and I, I want to give that energy to them as well. Uh, because I believe that that happy person who who's if they're pleased to see you, even, I mean, trust me, right? This is my life, right? As a DJ, most people love me, right? Because I, you know, playing music. And as a health and safety guy, when you turn up, most people don't love you. Right? But, I wasn't really realizing how polar opposite those things were because earlier I was thinking that well, you know, one of the things about being a DJ is everyone around you is happy. If they're not happy, they leave, and you look out there with a sea of happy people. And then you go out as a safety professional and people are ducking behind pipes thinking they can, oh, we're going to hide behind this pipe. And Clearing a site, like, you know, it, yeah, I mean, it can happen. And and um, I think one of the things that I aim to do always is when I turn up is, is I'm not, I'm not turning up as a health and safety guy. I'm turning up as Mark. I'm Mark. Okay. Here I am. I'm just a normal guy. You know, and is there anything that I can do to assist you guys to be able to do your job better, safer, uh, happier, more, you know, more safe and uh, or safer and more successful. Is there anything we can do today to actually affect that in the present moment? And then obviously going forwards. And I love that about what I do. And, and that's the attitude I bring to it. And that goes back to what we were saying before about hiring, you know, I, my own attitude is, is that, and the only, the only people that are around me are the people that will follow that and enjoy that and, and want to work that way. 
Well, and interestingly enough for your clients, you get them completely different information than someone goes out to audit or someone that goes out to um, do an observation against uh, uh, behaviors. Um, it's just completely different actionable information when you go out and engage like that because people are, oh, they'll, they'll talk to you. Yes. you know, that, that, again, we're back to self and team awareness. Let's have a conversation first, you know, let's find out where we have some commonalities in our vision and values. And, and, then, and then you'll tell me whether the processes work for you or not, because you trust me because we've got, we've had those interactions and those interfaces. There's a job that I've been out on recently. And one of the uh, traffic marshals at the main point of the, of the contact, his name's Byron. And every time I hear that, I've got a favorite singer whose name's Byron Stingley. And so every time I see Byron now, I just go, hey, Byron, come on, get up there. But I just start singing to him. And he's like, but why not? Because he's, he's like, oh, it's Mark. Oh, great. All right. Yeah. yeah. So how's everything going? He goes, yeah, it's good. You know, it's, it's got this little problem and we need to fix that. I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's great. You know, what can I do about that? Is there something I can help with? That's that's the job, yeah. you know. It's not walking around with a clipboard going, oh, you know, I have built this box and you haven't done it, and picking holes and trip hazard. <laughs> you know, I mean, yes, I'm that's responsible for that trip hazard. It's got to be there, but it's just, you know, do we need to like, you know, kick people like to, to you know, it's it's. I like to guide people much better, and it's such it's such a rewarding experience when you get up every day. You live to your purpose, as I spoke earlier, and you get out in the world and you actually do something that you feel good about. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it, it always amuses me when I get people trying to hide behind the behind the pipe. And I'm like, come on, mate, come here. Yeah, stop it. Stop that. You know, uh, you know but in a good way. And I'm always smiling and, and, and I enjoy what I do. And the, the book is basically a culmination of that history of, you know, being loved and then not being loved so much, but actually like finding a way through it and actually being able to deal with with everything that life can throw at you, you know, and, and that would be health, wealth, relationships, you know, ed, everything, business, the, the lot. Um, and so there's lots of, you know, there's lots of great information in life remix. And I hope it's going to, you know, a lot of people, as you say, are going to pick nuggets out of it and go, ah, that's something I can do. Yeah. Well, Mark, I, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about this and, and, and talking about your book. Is there a question you think I should have asked you that I didn't? That's a great question. That's I like great, to ask that a lot. That's a great question. It's like you've thrown me a proper curveball there, haven't you? Um, I, I don't know, actually. I think I've kind of covered a lot of the stuff I said. Obviously, um, I think one of the other things that I'm really passionate about is building businesses. Uh, and I think that leadership comes into that. And, and whether or not it's a question you could have asked me or not, I, I don't know. But what I would say is, is that if you're feeling, if anyone listening to this podcast and, and watching this, if anyone is having fearful thoughts and fearful uh, feelings about a certain way of life or a certain job or anything that, you know, that's really like getting them down, it could be relationships, could be anything. But the point is, is that, you know, always, 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 I had a great quote again, you cannot have faith and fear on the same subject at the same time. And you have a choice because faith and fear are two things that, require you to believe in something completely unseen so you can choose in any moment to be fearful about something or you can choose in any moment to have faith in yourself or the entire situation and when i the the things that brought around my brought about my biggest failures in life were actually me uh bringing about my greatest fears and all I've done since I brought about those greatest fears and was like 38, 39 bankrupt in my mum's spare room going, what's just happened from international DJ? Um, I've just chosen to have absolute faith in myself and what I'm doing. And for the last 12 years, I've had nothing but love and nothing but success. I just put out good energy. I get good energy back. That's how we're talking to each other. Right. I would just say to people, just, you know, study leadership, do your e-colors, understand a bit more about yourself. And also just keeping the positive emotions you know um just the last thing i think and grow rich you think it's about money that book but it isn't is it really it's not at all <laughs> not about money at all it's not about money it's actually about wealth true wealth right. uh, which is which is all of the positive emotions that you can choose to live in if you have absolute faith in yourself and what's going on around you yeah mark i really appreciate you coming uh coming on and uh um 
again, this has been a fantastic conversation. When's the book coming out? The book is going to be out in February. So uh, we're going to be doing uh, a lot of uh, marketing, a lot of videos. You can connect with me on liferemix.co.uk. You can also go to markwilkinsonofficial.com. Those are two websites we've got set up. Uh, we've got uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. They're all at Life Remix Book. Um, so you can get in touch there. Uh, and we're all over every social media. I'd love more people to connect with us uh, and just be on this journey together. Uh, you know, we want to um, help help as many people as possible, especially coming out of this crisis, which will happen. Things yeah. will start to change. We will come out of this pandemic. We will get into a new place. If you think back to 2008, everyone was fearful about losing money and there's not enough money in the world and the credit crunch. Now it's for fear of ill health and, and or death, right? And there'll be another one in seven to 10 years, there will be another crisis of some sort that humanity will get itself into this, this kind of state. What we've got to do is plan, plan, plan. And I want to help people with the strategies that I learned 12 years ago that have turned my life into a beautiful place to be. And that's, that's what Life Revix is about. And the book is out in February. Awesome. Well, Mark, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate you being on the Essential Leadership Cycle podcast with me. Uh, I've been your host and intentional leader, Rob Fisher, and everybody have a great day. Thank you, Rob. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.